So to start off, we're going to start by talking about body language. We're going to touch on dominance, dominance theory, and how that's going to play a role in terms of what we're seeing, what we're interpreting, and what we do with that information. Then we'll talk a little bit about animal welfare and stress in the shelter. So body language with dogs. Uh, this is going to hold true for most species of animals. It's the most clear signals they're going to give with the most information. It's going to be starting up here around the head and the face. So that's where we want to focus our, our uh, observations to start with. We're going to look at their head. We're going to look at their eyes, their ears, their teeth, uh, their lips, maybe even their eyebrows or their face wrinkle, things like that. Then we're going to look at the rest of the body to help make and confirm the decision of what we think that animal is trying to say. So we'll look at the position of the neck or the shoulders, um, and then we'll look at the rest of the body. And so we can get some pretty rough estimates of what that dog is trying to say from a distance by looking at the torso and the legs and how its body is positioned. But the more uh, signals from the face are going to be a little more in detail, and that's where we want to focus. We're also going to talk a little bit about aggression, conflict behaviors, and fear. And with that, we're going to include a little discussion about predatory behavior. So aggression. The main thing, the most aggressions that we see are going to be motivated uh, from an agonistic point. And agonistic is really just a fancy word that says distance increasing. The goal of the behavior of using that aggression is to increase the distance between them and whatever that threat is. Maybe they're going to try to get away, or they're trying to get that other party to increase its space away. So most of the aggressions we see, fear, uh, territorial, those types of things, are all based on trying to get something to get farther away. On the flip side of that, we've got predatory behavior. And actually, a lot of behaviorists are kind of leaning away from calling predatory behavior a type of aggression, because it's got a very different motivation. Uh, the motivation is hunger, right? We're not going to hunt most of the time. We're not going to be as you know, intent on doing that if we're not hungry. And it's actually a distance decreasing behavior. So it's the opposite. You don't want to get farther away from your prey. You want to get closer to it, right? And so it's kind of on a different spectrum. So in this picture, can you help me figure out who's predator and who's prey? What about this guy here, this goat? OK. What about these guys, these chicks? Okay, and uh, what about this guy? Predator. Okay, and what about this guy? Predator. What about, <laughs> okay, so there's some murmuring there. That's good. That's what I wanted to try to bring out here. <laughs> so he could, it depends, right? What about this guy? Okay, so what if this guy was going after this guy? What does this cat turn into? Everybody said predator. Now what is he? Prey. What about here? What's going on? <laughs> I bet you he probably doesn't feel like a predator right now, right? <laughs> so we need to think about the environment when we're trying to determine whether an animal is predator or prey. Sometimes it's very clear cut. Our chicks, our horses, our goats, our livestock, those are most of the time going to be a prey species, right? Then we have our higher predators, our large cats, our large canines, things like that. Most of the time they're predators, right? But then there's that gray zone. What about our domestic cats? What about our domestic dogs? Depends on who you're getting housed with. What about a ferret? Depends on who it's housed with, right? So if we're looking at prey species in general, we're going to see some differences in the way they're built. They're going to, eyes are going to be more lateral on the side of their face so that they can see a wider array of distance around them versus our predators who are going to have our eyes in front. So most of our dogs and cats are built much more like a predator. They're going to have poor depth perception because they want to have a be, be able to scan around them versus focusing in and being able to judge distances to get closer to their prey. But they're still going to have blind spots. So just a few things to think about. Whether you're a dog, cat, horse, or otherwise, there's going to be a few places you're going to have blind spots. Nobody likes to be snuck up on on their blind spot, right? I sure don't. People like to stand right back here behind me. And I'm like, what are you doing? It, you know, it worries me just like it's going to worry any other animal. Flight distance, same type of thing. And again, this is going to apply not only just to our livestock, but to our dogs and cats too. Because what are we to some of these dogs or cats, particularly the less socialized and the feral? We're a predator, right? Until proven otherwise, we're a predator. So flight distance is important. That's a critical distance away from an animal that's going to trigger it to move. So a dog might have a 10-foot flight distance. If we get inside that 10-foot, suddenly we're going to have a dog that's going to be trying to get away from us. We need to recognize that. Same for those cats. So when approaching these animals, we can use information that we have gained from livestock handling with some of our dogs and cats. So we avoid blind spots, right? We already talked about how uncomfortable that makes everybody. 
We want to go at a slow, steady speed. So none of that stop and start jerky movements, because those are what predators do, right? And we want to, um, we can actually move them using this information about flight distance. So if you're standing in front of the shoulder, they're more likely to go back. If you're standing behind the shoulder to them, they're going to move forward. This can work for dogs and cats too. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Touching on prey species, I, I love this picture. I love all these cats. Anti-predator behavior, if you are an animal in a situation, in an environment where you perceive there could be a predator around, anti-predator behavior is required for survival. If you can't do it, guess what's going to happen out in the, the nature? You're going to get eaten, right? So you have to do it, and you're really, really strongly motivated to do it. And so if you can't do it, and you're in an environment where you think there's a predator around, it's extremely stressful. Uh, it can lead to illness, abnormal behaviors. Those are neither things that we want in our shelter animals, right? So we need to make sure that we recognize this and give them a place to hide. So hiding is a behavior in anybody who's going to be considered a prey in the environment by fear, right? That makes sense. So for instance, gerbils that dig, stereotypic digging, if you give them somewhere to hide, so you give them a substrate and maybe a little nook where they can get down and be unseen, the stereotypic behavior is not going to be there. The same things with hens laying eggs. If you give them a place where they can lay their eggs and they're going to be protected from the open, wide environment, they're going to stand in line and wait to use that one single little box. They're highly motivated to do that behavior. Same thing with cats and hiding. So hiding boxes, even if it's just a shoe box or a blanket on half of the cage so that they can get behind it, so they think that nobody can see them. It can actually decrease their stress quite a bit. And there's been a couple of studies out there that have shown that that actually does not decrease their adoption rate. So key, huge thing for cats and shelters, give them a place to hide. So whether it's a cardboard box or a towel, you know, it doesn't have to be fancy and expensive, just some way for them to get away. So Dr. Ecker pointed out, all these cats like to sit in their litter box, right? Just because when there's not really a whole lot of other options, that's the closest thing that they can find to try to confine themselves into a little space. Try to do that anti-predator behavior. OK, moving on to aggression. So as we mentioned, most of our aggressions that we're going to talk about are agonistic or distance increasing. And the additional motivations that can underlie those or modify those are going to be fear, protecting resources, things of value that you need to survive, or social hierarchy. And the cool thing about aggression, particularly in our social species, is that a lot of it has been ritualized. Because if you think about it, it's really expensive to get into a fight, right? An actual combat of fight, physical contact, teeth and nails and hairs flying, you're going to get injured, right? You're less likely to be reproductively successful if you're injured. So if we can ritualize this and have these big displays that mean a lot of information, we can avoid the actual combat and everybody's more successful. So the more social the species, the more likely those behaviors are to be ritualized, which is great for us. That gives us some information to read. So a cool thing about this is, is a lot of these behaviors, at least in our dogs, are learned behaviors. And so they're innately there, but they have to learn how to use them in context. And we see a lot of that happening in puppy play. That's why puppy socialization is so important, because they learn how to communicate with their own species as well as all the other things that can happen with socialization, which is beyond the scope of this. So we can actually get a progression of signals throughout um, communication with these. Obviously, the first and easiest choice, if you're in a situation that makes you uncomfortable, just leave, right? <coughs> Walk away. And a lot of animals will do that, but sometimes they can't, or they, for whatever reason, choose not to. Then the next thing we start to see are these ritualized appeasement behaviors. Hey, I'm here, but please don't hurt me because I'm really trying hard not to be threatening to you. OK, we'll talk about what some of these look like. If that doesn't work, if that's not diffusing the situation, maybe we start to show conflict behaviors. Whoa, this is really uncomfortable. I'm not really sure what to do here. I'm giving you signals that says, gee, I really don't want this to escalate because it could get ugly. And then we start to get those other more clear warning signs, the ones we really don't want to push, right? The lip lift, the growl. The hard stare, when you see the whites of their eyes, the freeze. I always think of freezing as like they're holding their breath, they're moving around and suddenly they go. And that's when the hair on the back of your neck raises, and you're like, uh-oh, things are going to get bad, right? So don't ignore that. If the hair on the back of your neck goes up, there's probably a good reason. And then the snap and then the bite, right? Those are our combat. Those are the things we want to try to avoid. 
Okay, a, type, uh, a little word on arousal. A lot of people get arousal confused with aggression. And basically what arousal is, is an intense emotional state. So whatever is motivating that animal in that point in time, whatever you're gonna see is gonna be more intense. So if the dog is excited and he's highly aroused, the behavior that he displays because of excitement is gonna be a little more over the top. Same thing with fear. If we're afraid and we're highly aroused, our fear response is gonna be probably a little more exaggerated. So things to think about. If it's aggression, your aggression is gonna be a little more exaggerated. That's not a good thing, right? So things that I read as high arousal. The hackles go up, so that piloerection, right? The eyes are dilated. This is really usually pretty easy to see in dogs and cats because then you start to get that reflection on their tapetum and they look, look like the, the devil dog, right? People will say, well, he looked like the devil. There was something weird with his eyes. I didn't know what it was. His eyes were probably dilated and that really freaked him out. And an increased respiration rate. So it's pretty easy from a distance to tell whether someone's heaving and breathing fast versus having to get really up close and trying to measure their heart rate and things like that. So signals that we can get at a distance are going to be better for everybody involved, right? Okay, we're going to break down aggression here because I want to give you some idea of the different types of things you might see in different scenarios and how to interpret those. So offensive aggression, this is what we're going to start with. Um, offensive or confident aggression. This is that dog that means business, right? They said, I dare you to take a step closer, right? We want to respect that. So we're going to see, as our little friend here is demonstrating, the ears are forward, his head's up high, his eyes, look where his eyes are looking. They are laser pointed on whatever he's growling at, right? They're hard. You can't really see the eye, whites of his eyes, but that's not a nice look, right? His body weight is leaning forward. You can kind of see that from where his shoulders are. His tail's up. You can see it actually curled up over his back, even though it's a white tail. And it's probably stiff wagging. Some people will call this the unicorn dog. So you see him, ears are forward, and then his tail's back here behind his head, and he looks like he's got a horn. If he's showing you his teeth, you're only going to see his front incisors and his canine teeth. So just the front. You're not going to see his lips pulled back and all the sides of his molars and things like that. That can be hard to see unless the dog's actually confined some way. So usually when I see a dog like this and it's not tethered or behind a door, I'm moving quick, right? So I'm not going to be sitting there paying attention to, oh, is this offensive or defensive? Unless I've got some physical safety measures in there. If they're going to bite, they're usually going to bite and stand their ground. These might also be the dogs that bite and then bite again. Obviously, this is going to be a major issue. This is where people get seriously injured. So do not ignore these signs. Don't continue to press this dog because these are where people are going to get hurt very badly. So if we're going to look at a profile view, we're going to see a similar type of thing. I like this picture of the wolf because you can see just the incisors, right? You see how his lips are kind of pulled forward. His nose is wrinkled. He's got that laser eye, right? His ears are forward. The same with his body language. You can see as we go down through the shepherds on the side, his tail's up, he's leaning a little more forward, maybe his neck is stretched out a little bit. These are subtle, but as you start to recognize what you're looking for, for confirmation of what his face is saying, you can start to see these things at a little farther distance. So people who are skilled at reading body language, they can say, oh yeah, that dog's got offensive body language in the play yard, you know, several feet away, rather than having to be right up close and personal with his face, which I don't recommend. Okay, what about defensive? So the flip side. So we're going to see a lot of signals are going to be opposite. And if we're looking at their face, they're going to be clearly opposite. So as our Dalmatian friend is pointing out here, his ears are back, right? We don't really see his ears because they're pulled fairly far back to his neck. His head's a little lower. I think the trigger that's making him do this is up high, so he's kind of lifting his head up. But it's almost like he's hunching his shoulders, right? His body weight is probably going to be back. We don't see his tail, so he's not that unicorn dog, right? So his tail is probably down low or tucked. And we see all of his teeth, right? You can almost do an oral exam on this dog from this photo, right? So he's pulling his lips back, showing you all he's got. And if he's going to bite, he's going to be the one that's more likely to bite and run or maybe snap the air and take a step back. So again, I don't recommend people continuing to escalate a confrontation with these dogs but usually these are the ones that are going to bite and run. Does that make sense? Okay. So again, we're looking at our profile view, our, our wolf friends here, and you can see all of their teeth, right? 
whether we're just snarling, we see all the way back to his molars. Same type of thing, if we're going to bite, we've got all those teeth. And this guy down on the bottom, he's probably snapped and now he's taken off. That's what we're going to see. And then we get into the, the gray area, the ambivalent body language, the conflict types of aggression. These are what we're seeing when we've got an animal who's got mixed motivations. So we have mixed motivations, we have mixed signals. Oh, I want to go, but I'm afraid. Well, I'm afraid, but I really don't want to leave this really high value resource, that type of thing. Um, if we have an animal who started out very fearful and they used aggression as a last ditch effort to get themselves out of a really stressful confrontation, hey, guess what? It's really effective, right? It worked. Most rational people or other species or conspecifics are going to back off if they're getting that extreme of a display, right? So that dog's actually been reinforced. Hey, that got me out of a pickle. I'm going to try that again. And I'm pretty confident it's going to work again. So you start to see changes into more confident body language. So we'll get a lot of dogs that will come into the clinic and they're showing us this very impressive display of confident aggression. But when we start going back into the history and we talk about the early incidents that occurred, they look very different. This dog has just learned over time that this is a really good coping tool and it gets him out of a bind. Obviously, it's not a very desired coping tool, but it's effective, right? So we can see things like a hard stare, which we see with our offensive, but the ears are back. Or maybe we see the body leaning forward, but when it bites or snaps, it runs away. It backs away. And these can actually switch very quickly, which is kind of a scary thing because we can see this change fairly rapidly over time. And so we need to be aware of these dogs, and we see it, we're like, okay, there's either some type of motivation issue here, or he's learning, and he's learning at a fast rate. And we need to address it now so we don't get that more dangerous, more confident dog. And again, same type of thing. We've got our profiles and our shepherds here, and we're going to pick out the ones that are going to be a little more ambivalent, right? Mixed messages. So we've got just the incisors and the canines, but the ears are starting to go back. What about their body? So maybe their tail's wagging a little bit. Maybe it's not up so high, but they're still leaning forward. Those types of things are what we're going to see. All right, conflict behaviors. So a conflict behavior is a signal a dog is going to give that says, I'm uncomfortable. You know, I'm trying not to be threatening here, but this is getting tense, and I'm not really sure what to do. And we can start out with appeasement, and we can get a little more into uh, more active behaviors. So we can see things like the play bow. A lot of people say, oh, he's play bowing. How cute. He wants to play, right? But if you actually look at what a play bow is, it's a ritualized conflict behavior. So our behind's up in the air, right? And our front legs are stretched down low to the ground. So this dog is in actuality saying, hey, I want to come and approach you and interact. But I'm in a position that if I need to, I can get away really fast, right? So it's a signal of conflict. It's been ritualized, puppy play, things like that. They learn, oh, I see this signal. He wants to play, but he's not really sure who I am yet, right? Kind of like shaking hands. Uh, what about the rollover? We roll over and we show our belly. And we says, oh, he wants a belly rub, right? And they lean over the top of the dog and get their hands down in there and then wonder why they got bitten. Most of the time, I'm going to say 90% of the time, Rolling over and exposing your belly means, I'm no threat, please don't hurt me. This is really scary, I'm giving up, okay? And then we escalate, we lean over the top of it, we reach our hands down over the top of it, and we make it even worse, right? So, let's think about that. Licking the lips, anything that is happening more frequently and it's out of context, so licking the lips, sneezing, going off and sniffing the ground, uh, circling, so we'll see a lot of dogs come up and they kind of do a drive-by and they circle back around. Uh, looking up at the ceiling, we get a lot of dogs that come in and they're like, checking out the ceiling. We're like, what's so interesting up there? It's because they're conflicted. They don't want to make eye contact with us. This is a lot less threatening than looking straight at you. Okay. Localizing, so that high-pitched kind of whiny pant. You guys know what I'm talking about. I think of shepherds when I hear this. Um, other things are like the yawn with the squeak at the end, those types of things. A paw lift. Same type of thing. I want to approach, but I'm ready to back away quickly if I need to. So we've got our rollover, right? We'll talk a little bit more about rollers in just a second. What about this one? The doggy smile. Who's seen this? I love these guys. The first time you see him, you're like, oh my god, he's showing my te his teeth. I got to get away, right? But look at the whole picture. Look at the whole message this dog is sending. Yes, he's showing you his incisors and his canine teeth only, right? Okay. So that could be offensive aggression, but look at his eyes. 
all squinty, right? His ears are back. That doesn't make sense with just his teeth being shown. And if you look at his whole body, if you've ever seen a dog do this, he's probably really wiggly. You know, he's wiggling around. He's probably rolling around on the ground. It's an appeasement behavior. He's like, I'm so excited you're here, but you're kind of scary. I had a dog who would do this every time I'd walk into the exam room. He loved me because I was the treat lady, but I also had these things that were sharp and pokey. And so he's like, I don't really know how I feel about you, but this is pretty intense, and I think I like you, but don't poke me, okay? You can see these two dogs showing a variety of different ritualized behaviors. We've got the play bow on the dog on the left. We've got the paw lift, the one on the right. They're talking to each other. This is a conversation. And again, some demonstrations. We got the look away. I love to watch dogs do this. One of my dogs will actually do this with me. If I look directly at her, she turns her head. <laughs> if I turn my head away, she'll turn, orient back towards me, and we can play a game, a head turn game. Dogs will do this to each other, too. They'll walk up, they'll look. Oh, this is a little uncomfortable. Okay, I'll turn my head. And so you can look for these types of things. The play bow. We see the puppy as well as the wolf on the bottom doing a paw lift, maybe a little bit of appeasement licking. <laughs> Okay, a word on rolling over. This slide actually stemmed out of a long conversation we had with some volunteers at Paws Chicago. We were talking about rollover because there are a couple of people that just couldn't believe that not every dog who rolled over didn't want a belly rub because they had dogs at home that rolled over and we were truly asking for a belly rub. Okay, so your dog flips over. Again, let's go back and look at the whole picture. Look at the dog on the left, the Visla. Where are his ears? Back. Where's his tail? He's tucked. He looks pretty tense to me, right? I could probably see him vibrating in real life. This dog does not want a belly rub. No way, right? What about the one on the right? Where's his tail? <laughs> it's probably flopping all around, right? Can't see his ears, but I expect they're going to be nice and soft and loopy. Look at his legs, you know, all the way up in the air. He's having fun. This one's probably going to be a little more safe. So look at the whole picture. You see a signal. You're not sure what to do with it. The front teeth rolling over. Look at the whole picture. Use those other confirmatory signals to help give you a clear picture of what that dog's trying to tell you. All right, here's a little video clip. This is uh, from the Purdue Behavior Clinic. It's a compilation of different patients that have come in that are showing behavior signs indicative of conflict. So I want you to shout out anytime you see a conflict behavior, OK? Good. Good. Mm -hmm. His owner thinks he loves this toy. It's one of those little Furbies that makes those weird noises. She's like, look how much he loves it. He's talking to it. He's doing that Whoa! thing at the end, you know, chattering. I'm hearing people say, poor dog. He is. Yeah, he had no idea because he didn't understand body language. The scratching, that's another one. That's out of context, right? He says, can I fit under here? <laughs> oh my gosh, right? Poor dog. What about this guy? Does he want to be hugged and petted and kissed and hugged? What do you see that's telling you no? He's so stiff, right? Oh, he's like, I want to be near you, but please don't touch me. Please. This makes my heart rate increase, because I expect this guy to get bitten in the face when he leans down. What about this one? There's lots and lots of dogs barking in the background with this. I wish you could hear the sound. Wet dog shake? That's one, yeah. Good? Yeah. You see that? When you approach with the leash, he was in that dog's flight distance. What about this one? This dog's growling ferociously. <laughs> He says, he's the king of the couch. That's his throne. His owner's standing right there talking to him. He's probably not tired, right? He's starting to growl now. You guys can't hear it. He doesn't have peanut butter stuck to the roof of his mouth, right? So the licking's kind of out of context. So he's saying, this is really stressful, guys. Come on. Yeah, so it's ambivalent, right? His ears are forward, but he's like, oh, God. 
Did you see the whale eye, the little whites of his eyes? Mm -hmm. Does this dog want to be friends with this little boy? The little boy is saying, he bite me, he bite me, over and over again. You see the pawing at the face afterwards? I mean, come on. <laughs> and again, another one. Look at this poor dog's face. What do you see on this dog's face? Okay. I hear resignation. That's an interpretation. What are you observing? There's a knife on the floor. This owner's convinced that this dog is guarding a butter knife. This dog really had no idea the knife was there. It's the confrontation with the owner that is the trigger for this. All right, and this goes on and on and on, but I'm going to stop it so we don't run out of time here. You saw the best ones, so. <laughs> Moving on to fear. Okay. So, as we talked about aggression, most of our aggression is, is agonistic, distance increasing, right? Go away. Same thing with fear, right? We use fear responses to get ourselves out of something scary. So, we have fight or flight, and some will even add in freeze there. We're going to talk about that with learned helplessness. The choice as to whether they choose to leave or they choose to use fight is oftentimes determined in part by genetics, the way they're hardwired. Some dogs are much more likely to stand and have a confrontation to get you out of their space versus leaving themselves. Again, there's also going to be a lot of context involved in that, but sometimes it's the way an animal's wired. And so we have dogs like that Cocker Spaniel that was saying, get the heck away from me now, was giving that, that, that child very clear signals, and lots of them, right, before he attempted the snap. So in my eyes, that's a pretty normal dog. He's saying, this is really scary. This is really stressful. Please go away. Really? I mean it. Go away. Uh, now, you know, it's like getting into a shouting match before he resorted to aggression. So fear and anxiety behavior. Some of these are going to overlap with what we saw with defensive aggression. That makes sense because defensive aggression is normally motivated out of fear, right? Ears back, heads down low, looking away, darting their eyes. So you see the little eyebrows moving everywhere. Wrinkles on the forehead, just like us, right? Tight lips, really pursed in the face. Their body weight's leaned back or they're lowered to the ground. Maybe they're rolling over, their tail's tucked. These are the dogs that are the faucets, right? They walk in and suddenly the drool is just dripping. It's not because they're anticipating the yummy peanut butter Kong that they have no idea is there. They're freaked out, right? Trembling, they all, everybody comes in and says, oh, he's cold all the time. Probably not, he's probably really anxious. We get a lot of dogs that will come in and they'll lie down and close their eyes about halfway through a consult. Look, he finally relaxed. But you see the dog breathing heavily. And he'll open his eyes and look around. He's just given up. That's learned helplessness, right? I can't have no control over the situation. There's nothing I can do. This is really, really awful. I'm just going to shut down. That's a welfare issue, right? Vomiting, diarrhea, urinating on themselves. Holy cow, that's a panicked dog, right? Not taking treats. This is a big one. If you're working with a dog and suddenly he stops taking treats, that's the key that whatever's going on has suddenly gotten so stressful that dog's not learning anything good anymore. So it's not that he's suddenly not hungry unless you gave him a whole bag of hot dogs. Something scary is going on. You need to look around and see what it is. Is it something you're doing, something else in the environment, but something scary. So this dog, I don't know how well it's going to project on here was uh, a dog that was down in a Florida shelter. And the uh, group wanted to show off their uh, behavior modification routine. And this dog was a you know, nine-year-old Roddy thing that came in. And he's a typical nine-month-old Roddy. Hello, everybody, I'm here. And he's bounding around and jumping and being a normal, jumpy, mouthy, juvenile dog, right? And say, oh, he's just being over the top, and he's trying to dominate us. So they put a prong collar on him, gave him one correction, and this is what happened. He went from jumping around and, and bounding around and wanting to greet everybody. He hit the deck. And can you see the wrinkles on his forehead, the wrinkles around his mouth here, up here in between his eyebrows? His ears went back. He's not in a down position being asked to be in a down. He's in a down because he was terrified. Does that help you guys see it? OK, good. You almost get a little bit of a whale eye there. Right around the edge, you're starting to see the whites of his eyes. This dog is like, oh my god, what the heck happened? This was fun, and now it's really not, right? 
So again, same type of thing that we were seeing earlier. We have some fear and anxiety behaviors. Again, they're going to overlap with some of the defensive aggression. So what does that mean? If we have fear and anxiety behaviors overlapping with defensive aggression, what could happen if we continue to provoke a fearful dog? Yeah, it could bite you. We could push it into defensive aggression. So recognize this and say, okay, what's going on that's so scary? What can we do to make it less scary before we hit that tipping point? All right, I'm going to get on my soapbox for just a minute, and I'll try to do this quickly, and then I'll get off, okay? So dominance theory is something that's been around for a long time, uh, and it's been popularized by the media. And we all know who I'm talking about in general. <laughs> and it's, people see it on TV, well-meaning dog owners, and they're frustrated with their dog's behavior. They say, well, it worked in 30 minutes on TV. I'm going to try it, right? Despite the little warning at the bottom that says, do not try this at home, right? But most of the dominance theory is actually based on conclusions drawn from captive wolf packs. And they said, okay, this is what we're seeing in captive wolf packs that we've created artificially. They're not related. This is what they're doing with each other. And we're going to make the leap of faith that says, okay, this is what they do in the wild, and this is what our dogs are going to do at home. And then we're going to add in the other caveat and cross species. So it's no longer dog-to-dog -dog communication. It's dog-to-person communication. So these are all leaps of faith that we're extrapolating and assuming are there. Right? And so what happens is that we're using these adversive handling and training techniques that are rooted in this dominance theory because we have to be the alpha leaders, right? And we're giving these owners the assumption that unless we do something, dogs are going to try to usurp us, basically, right? And they're going to dominate us and control the environment and control the resources and take over the government, you know, all of this stuff. <laughs> it, it's rubbish, right? But in actuality, most of the common behavior problems that we see, and I'm not even talking about pathologic problems, I'm talking about normal dog behaviors that are problems to owners, are usually such as aggression, fearfulness, destructive behavior, inappropriate elimination, <laughs> vocalizing, or attention-seeking behaviors that are just obnoxious. They're usually associated with anxiety, not dominance. Okay? We don't know what to do. We want to talk to you, but we don't have a common language. So what do we do? We try this, we try that, we try this, and guess what? Some of it pays off because we got your attention. No, bad attention sometimes is better than none at all. So guess what? We've inadvertently rewarded the dog. And that's where a lot of these conflicts come in. So things about adversives and pu positive punishment in particular, we can actually see short-term inhibition of behaviors that are unwanted using adversives. But that does not mean that the motivation to perform the behavior has changed. So Dr. Lucia, my mentor, used to say, you can punish an autistic child severely enough that it will stop rocking. But have you done anything to stop the reason that child needs to rock? Absolutely not. And you and I, I'm sure, can all agree that that's a welfare issue if we're doing that to a child, right? It's no different for our dogs. So the other thing is that there's side effects with this. You know, if we respond harshly using aversives or punishment <coughs> to a dog's inappropriate behavior, particularly if it's based out of fear, we're going to make it worse. It's going to increase its fear and its anxiety and its reactivity. And that is now going to be associated with the owner or the person performing that. So now, not only are they stressful about whatever situation was happening, they're also stressful about you being around. And that's not conducive to the human-animal bond, right? And it's actually going to escalate things. They're going to anticipate, like, oh, yeah, this was bad last time, so I bet it's going to be bad this time, so I'm going to try to stop it before it gets to that point. So we see those dogs get worse and worse and worse every time. So what's our alternative? Our alternative is to understand why the dog is behaving the way it is and be empathetic. He's probably doing it because he's anxious and afraid. 90% of the time, if you're in a vet's office and the dog's coming in and being aggressive, I will bet you money he's doing it because he's terrified. Right? Not because he wants to dominate your staff. So a nice little thought from Temple Grandin. She said, well, dog guys, calmer animals are easier to handle, right? She's looking at it from a large animal perspective, but I argue that it's for our domestic animals too. She says it takes 20 to 30 minutes for a fearful animal to calm down. I argue it might be even longer, particularly if we're talking about cats, right? Days, weeks sometimes, <laughs> right? So. The key is to prevent them from ever getting to that point, right? If we can get what we need to done without ever getting to the point where we have to let them go and take a break and come back, we're going to be more efficient, and that animal's welfare is going to be so much better, right? So it's a win-win situation. So think about the environment. 
we perceive the environment differently than they, they do. We use words. You know, we look at the clock and we say, okay, it's round and it's a certain time. We use words to describe that. Animals don't. They use smell, what they see, different scents in the environment. So we have to kind of look around and say, okay, what is the dog perceiving? That's getting him all upset. We may not notice it initially, but if we take a step back and look, like, oh, yeah, I hear a lot of dogs barking and this dog's never been around dogs before. That can be really scary, right? So maybe we need to do something about the noise where that dog is right now. And it is possible to have a well-trained dog without having to use punishment and dominance. Actually, I think it's a lot easier. So easier for our owners to apply as well. And we need to have some control over their behavior. I'm not saying that we can let them run amok and do whatever they want whenever they want and have no repercussions. But if we're consistent and fair and reasonable, we can have a really good working relationship with them. So we can actually be the ones that start the difference. So we can practice it with our own animals. We can practice it at work with our patients and our shelter animals that we're working with. And we can lean, lead by example and then start to educate the public. People will stop and say, wow, your dog is so well behaved. I don't see him pulling at all. How did you do that? Well, you can say, well, he's wearing a body harness that helps to stop pulling. And it's comfortable for him, and we've taught him that he can go forward, but there's tension when he comes back. And this is a much more compatible thing. So the dogs that come in, people c come into your house and they're not jumping on you, wow, I wish my dog could do that. You can talk to them about how we've trained our dogs through consistent and fair training, positive reinforcement. This is a much better alternative because good things happen when you do this, and nothing happens when you jump. Okay? So you guys are the leaders in this. We're already making some headway, but you guys are the next step. All right, I'm off my soapbox now. Everybody's good, right? We're going to touch on animal welfare and stress in the shelter here in the next couple of minutes. So who's heard of the five freedoms? Raise your hand. Good, about a third of you or so. So the five freedoms are something that came out of the Animal Welfare Act, basically having a list of things that animals are innately entitled to in their environment, particularly domesticated animals that we're taking care of. Freedom from hunger and thirst, that's kind of a no-brainer, right? We don't want them to starve to death. Freedom from discomfort, we don't want them to be uncomfortable or painful. Think of that arthritic dog on a cold concrete kennel floor, right? Uh, freedom from pain, injury, or disease, so we prevent it or we treat it when it's there. Freedom to express normal behavior, and I'm not talking about sexual reproductive behavior in our spayed, neutered dog population, that's kind of beyond the, what they intended for this to be. But, you know, being able to be a cat and scratch, you know, or hide if you're a cat, those types of things, those are normal behaviors, right? Uh, and freedom from fear and distress, right? Stress affects welfare and it affects adoptability. So if we can identify stress and do something about it, our animals are going to become much more adoptable because they're going to be showing more normal behavior that's more uh, appealing to the public. They're more likely to go home, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about signs of stress. We've touched on a lot of them already and then areas we can address in our shelters. So fear and anxiety, we've kind of beat that to death already, right? Um, recognize who's a prey species in your environment and who else is around, right? So a ferret could be a, pre a predator if it's in there with the small furry creatures, but if it's a dog next door, he's now the prey, right? So things to think about. Um, I want to touch on feigned sleep and learned helplessness a little bit more. I talked about that a little bit with the dogs, but this is something we see very commonly, particularly in cats in the shelter, is they're kind of withdrawn, they're curled up in the back, and so if you go into some of those those rooms that are like wall-to-wall -wall cats, right? And you walk in and it's silent. And you look around and every cat's curled up into a tight little ball in the corner. You're like, oh, it's so peaceful in here, right? Everybody's sleeping. And then you look a little bit closer and you see the ears are moving. Maybe an eye's popping open here and there and scanning. The respiratory rates may be a little higher than normal. You might see frequent minor shifts of position. Those cats are in feigned sleep. They're like, this is so incredibly stressful, I can't even allow myself to perceive it. So they're curled up into a tight little ball in the back of the kennel. That's, that's a stressed cat. And that can take some time to pick up on, particularly with newer volunteers and things like that, for them to recognize that this cat's kind of upset right now. The other thing I want to talk about is frustration. Frustration is another thing that can really affect welfare. So that's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. So we have the extremely stressed, quiet, inhibited, learned helplessness, and then we've got frustration. So we've got frustration as a definition of motivated to perform a behavior, but we don't have a proper outlet, right? 
and it can result in high arousal. We talked about arousal leading to extreme responses, depending on what the animal is motivated to do. The jumpy mouthy dogs, those guys are usually highly motivated to have social interaction. Acute conflict behaviors, like stereotypic behaviors, like circling. A very active dog that's stuck in a smaller kennel for a large amount of time. We can see that out of frustration. Cage biting, again, I think of those really social dogs. And we're walking by and they don't pay attention. Another one walks by and they don't pay attention. They're like, oh, I'm screaming here. Please pay attention to me. And it turns into bar biting on the front of the kennel. Aggression can be another one. Aggression can be a result of frustration. Fence running, I think of fence running when I think of this. I want to interact, I want to interact, and I can't, so I'm just going to pace the fence and growl and snap and carry on at anybody that walks by. Charging the kennel door can be another one. And it's, it's really hard to ignore some of these behaviors. If you have an 80-pound dog hanging off your arm because he wants to interact with you, that's really hard to ignore, right? So it gets rewarded on accident really easily. The ones I think of that are really particular high risk for this is our working dogs. The highly social dogs and cats, so the dog cats, everybody know who I'm talking about when I say that? Really social ones, the dog cats, they want to follow you around, like, hey, what you doing? Can I join in? You know, all the time. Uh, or the trainable breeds, so the shepherds, the herding breeds, our Rotties and Dobermans, and any terrier. I don't care if it's a Jack Russell terrier or a Pitbull terrier, they're all terriers, they're all active, high energy dogs who have been bred to some degree to hunt, right? They're going to be very frustrated very easily. Okay, so the law of effect, I want to point this out. Dogs are learning, and cats, all the time, whether we want them to or not. And so we have to keep the law of effect in mind when we're just interacting with them on a daily basis or not interacting with them. If a behavior is increased or results in a pleasant consequence, it's going to increase, right? It's rewarded. If nothing happens, it'll eventually fade away. If something bad happens, it'll also decrease, but oftentimes at a faster rate. The key to this is, is that the interpretation of the consequence, bad, neutral, or good, doesn't matter as to what we want it to be. It matters to how the animal perceives it. Okay? So if we intend it to be good and the animal doesn't think a hug is good, it's not going to have the intended result that we wanted it to. So think about that in terms of the animal's perception. What am I doing as a result of the behavior? And how do I intend it? How is this animal most likely going to perceive it. And you can use body language cues to interpret that. So the hand over the top of the head ruffling the, the fur, there's a lot of dogs that really like that and they couldn't care less. But if you get the dog that you know hunches down every time the hand over the head comes up, is that dog perceiving that fur ruffling is a good thing? Not so much, right? It's like that Labrador we saw that was getting petted. Ew, that wasn't so cool for him, right? Okay few key areas that we can address fairly straightforwardly, we look at the environment. Look at how big it is, look at the indoor versus outdoor. If you have the opportunity to get these guys outdoors, you're automatically enriching the environment, right? Just due to changes that are going on outside. Noise is a big one. Noise can be good and noise can be bad, right? Barking dogs, easily over OSHA acceptable levels for us. Can you imagine what it is for dogs and cats whose ear hearing is much more sensitive than ours? But there's other things, like maybe we have classical music hour in the shelter, where we play a nice, slow cello solo, or a piano concerto, or something like that. That could be really appealing to a lot of animals. Um, looking at enrichment, there were some studies out there that were looking at beds. Beds in kennels actually increased adoptability for dogs, particularly if they were at the front of the kennel. Toys, again, too, even if the animal wasn't playing with them, the perception was that the animal was more adoptable. Social interaction with conspecifics, meaning their own species members or with people, can also be good or it can be bad, right? So if we haven't been socialized to it, it's potentially scary until proven otherwise. But there are some animals, like the golden retriever, who's starting to bar bite because it has 50 people walking by his kennel every day who are not interacting with him. That dog really needs some controlled social interaction with people, right? And you can really help that animal's welfare by adding that into his daily routine. And then exercise, right? Think about those working breeds. They need something to do. Even if it's just a quick jaunt outside, that's better than nothing, right? And we can teach leash manners. If we teach them leash manners, they're automatically more adoptable, right? Okay, and this is just going to go through a few more details of that. Um, the slides are going to be with Maddie's, so we shouldn't have an issue with that. And I'm running out of time. Um, and it's basically everything that I had already told for you. So, conclusions. The big things I want you to take home from this. When reading body language, start with the head. 
Then look at the rest of the body to confirm or refute what you think the face and the head are saying, okay? Beware of conflict behaviors. So those mixed motivations, those ambivalent signals, like, okay, well, what is he really saying here? That's saying to you, if you're seeing those mixed signals, beware, he's aroused, he wants to, but he's afraid. So think about what you're gonna do next. Most aggression is gonna be based in fear. So we need to be empathetic with that they're afraid rather than using punishment, which is going to be ineffective and counterproductive. And when we're evalu evaluating welfare, we want to start with the enclosure, easiest thing to do, and where it is. So think of your cats. We don't want to house cats in the same room with dogs if we can avoid it, right? What about your avian species? If you guys are taking birds in, where do you not want to put them? With cats, right? So there's a little bit of commonsensical thing. And I understand that there's going to be environmental issues with the way shelters are built and where we have an older building and things like that. Some of this may be unavoidable, but there's other things that you can do to try to mitigate some of that stress. So white noise, maybe visual barriers, those types of things. Maybe even some sense to try to you know, mask the predator smell to try to decrease the stress with that. And then if you have any questions at any time, you can either come talk to me, feel free to email me. Um, any Anything like that. Thank you.